Paula Neyman. Woo! Woo! Wow, wow. This day has been in the making for a long time, and I'm thrilled to be here with you all. Dr. Neyman was a friend, an advocate, and more importantly, a fierce survivor of some of this world's darkest days. Taking a moment because uh, I'm getting off script. I just got back from Israel on Friday, and I'm taking a brief moment there uh, because I just got back from Israel on Friday. And when we're talking about darkest days, it looks like we're trying, we're heading there. And so what I ask today is certainly the light that Dr. Naaman was, is that we carry it. We talk about the stories, and more importantly, we talk about the hostages that are still there. And we talk about making sure that the world knows that we stand together to not only never forget, but to not repeat. And so I'm here to stand and bear witness as to the atrocities that we've seen, and we will call it out. And we continue to support Israel. So that was my slight comment, um, just because at the end of the day, we are here um, to honor her life. We are here to honor the fact that she escaped the barbaric terrorists that were the Nazis. And we see them trying to come back into our communities. We're gonna stop that because we are gonna shine the light that she's shown. And we're gonna shine the light through hope and through talking about it and never forgetting and never repeating. So taking that moment, uh, I also wanna... Ooh, that was hard, guys, that was really hard. Um, Oof, this is going to be hard. Um, oof, we'll get through it. Um, Are you okay with me talking about my story? No, she said that. Absolutely. Okay. All right. And with that, um, I want to talk about how her life changed in 1941 when the Nazis invaded her town, executing young Jewish boys. Her family was transported to the Vilna ghetto, and her stepfather was arrested, only to never see him again. When Paula, her mother, and her Aunt Rachel were transported to a labor camp via a railroad car, her five-year-old sister, Lincoln, was concealed in a large knapsack. Unfortunately, her sister was discovered by the Germans, the Nazi Germans, and ripped from Paula's arms, later dying in the Auschwitz camp. By a miracle, Paula, her mother, and her aunt remained together throughout five concentration <coughs> camps and two death marches. We we're talking about light and resiliency. <coughs> we talk about that. The three would later arrive in New York City in 1947, where Paula went on to meet her husband, Daniel Teddy Neiman, at a Purim party for Holocaust survivors. And they wed on May 5th, 1950. Though she missed much of her education due to the war, Paul dreamed of, Paula dreamed of being a doctor and did not let her past impact her future. She worked as an x-ray technician while attending City College and Hunter College, later graduating as one of only three women from the NYU College of Medicine in 1957. She would go on to become a pediatrician, inspiring her children and countless others to proceed, pursue a career in medicine. Dr. Paula Neyman is an example of resiliency, strength, and hope. She was a woman of intellect, speaking six languages and harboring a deep love of learning. She was committed to teaching the youth about the dangers and impact of racism and anti-Semitism, telling her story often. Her one lament was the hate she continued to bear against the Nazis and the good Germans who never spoke up. She compensated for this by bestowing immense love and generosity upon others, including her family and everyone she had a connection with. Paula was a woman of her word, loyal and a friend to many. Story like hers must continue to be told to ensure atrocities of the Holocaust and contributions uh, to the Holocaust survivors are never forgotten. And so joining us today, the man with a plan, <laughs> um, Rabbi Barry uh, Katz of Katz. Thank you. Thank you, Council President. Thank you for the words that you prepared and thank you especially for the words that you were not prepared to say. That are so so important for us to hear and if Paula would be devastated today to look around at what's going on in the country that welcomed her and her mom 
and Teddy and all the Holocaust survivors and so many generations of immigrants to see what is going on in our country right now with the anti-Semitism rising, with hate of all kinds, it would be devastating to her. So the way we got to be standing here actually is connected to Israel. And Paula, Paula would be so upset to know what happened on October 7th, the hostages. She would for sure be wearing one of these buttons. I have buttons afterwards if you want. Bring them home buttons for the hostages. And this story actually started in Israel 26 years ago. I was a rabbi in Monroe, New York in Orange County and we took a trip to Israel. And on the trip, Paula and Teddy and several family members, including one of their granddaughters, who was having a bat mitzvah. She was having a bat mitzvah. There's another young person here who also had one of their b'nai mitzvah that morning at the Kotel. And when we went as a group to Yad Vashem, after being at Yad Vashem, the tour guide asked everybody who was there to share their reflections. We had just finished being in the Children's Memorial at Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust Museum, where there's one candle that's reflected a million times. And he asked everybody what was their reaction. And Paula said, when I look at all those candles, I hope that my sister who was killed and all of the million children who were killed, I hope that they know that we are remembering them. Fast forward 25 years. I was on a trip to Israel along with some really incredible public officials from the Bronx, including Congressman Richie Torres, our borough president, the DA of the Bronx, and we went to Yad Vashem. And the tour guide was the exact same tour guide who led my shul trip 25 years before. And, at the, and on the bus to Yad Vashem, he said, I'm going to tell the story of your congregant of Paula. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I've told that story. I hope that they know that we're remembering them. I've told them every trip that I've led. He's a very busy tour guide in, in Israel for the past 25 years. And so at the end of the trip, he told Paula's story. And the congressman came over to me and several other elected officials there. And he said, I want to know more about Paula. Tell me more about Paula. And I shared some of the story that the council person just shared. And our congressman Richie Torres said, without missing a beat, there should be a street named after her in the Bronx on Lydig Avenue. But then he thought for a second and he said, oh, but I'm not a city council person anymore. I can't do that. But I know some city council people. Honestly, I didn't think about it too much. A week and a half after we got back from Israel, I got a call from Congressman Richie Torres' office saying that he had connected with City Council person Velasquez's office and City Councilman Dinowitz's office, and we were ready to start the process. And so we did. And so we started gathering all of the things that you need to get the City Council to say yes to something like this. And the council people did their thing. Everyone did their thing. People wrote affidavits attesting to who Paula was and why it's appropriate that a street corner is named after her. And it's appropriate because she was someone who never forgot. She never forgot. And she devoted her whole entire life to taking care of children, all of those million children that she could not save, including her sister, including all of her relatives. She wanted to take care of kids and to have a sign for a pediatrician who took care of children, who spoke out against hate over and over again at our regional Holocaust Memorial Day events and in schools. To have that sign right outside of a school is so important. And for the people who live in this neighborhood, it's great that we're all here, but we need to make sure that everybody in all these stores knows why this name is up here. They need to know that story because Paula was someone did it make a difference who you were when you came into her office, when you saw her at Einstein, she was a professor at Einstein for many years, she took care of you because she knew that children needed to be protected. And so it is a great honor. I thank Congressman Richie Torres and City Council Person Velasquez and, and Eric Dinowitz as well for all of their efforts to the name and family who worked so hard to make all this possible, who brought the sound system and, uh, and all of that. It's really very, very meaningful to be here. The one last thing I'll say about Paula is, so she was a member of my congregation in Monroe, um, pediatrician. She was our, child, our children's first pediatrician. 
And when my son was eight days old, seven days old, eight days old, um, he spiked a fever. It was the day before his wrist. Uh, we were worried. I was in synagogue that morning. It was a holiday. Paul, I told Paula, you know, I don't know. Our son is, doesn't seem to be right. She immediately left, went to the house, which was right behind where the synagogue was, and she checked him out. When I came home after synagogue, my sister-in-law told me that my wife and baby were at Paula's office. They called. They said, you need to take, go to the hospital right now. He is very, very sick. He could die. And we rushed to the hospital, and he's fine. He's here. <laughs> and it was all because of Paula. So in addition to all of the amazing things that Paula did for our synagogue in Monroe, for all the things that she did for the Pelham Parkway Jewish community and general community, I owe Paula a huge debt of, dad, a huge debt of gratitude. Thank you all for being here. I uh, would like to recognize my dear friend and colleague, Congressman Richie Torres, uh, for joining us this morning. And trust me, this man has an incredible schedule, so uh, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Come on. Good morning, everyone. Um, you know, I never had the honor of meeting Paula, uh, but I first heard, heard Paula's story. Uh, as the rabbi noted, when Rabbi Katz and I were in Israel, uh, we were in Israel together a year before, about a year before the October 7 terror attacks. And as we were touring Yad Vashem, Rabbi Katz shared with me Paula's story as a survivor of the Holocaust and as a beloved pediatrician right here in Lydic Abbey. She was an institution in Palin Parkway. And being the former council member, I said, you know, we need a street renaming. But as you, as you rightly pointed out, Congress has no role in street renamings. But thankfully, I know one of the best council members, Marjorie Velasquez, and I just want to say this moment would not have been possible. Were it not for your leadership, you could not have been more responsive and accommodating. So thank you for creating this special moment for Paula and her family. Um, You know, I cannot help but feel overwhelming admiration for the unsung heroism of Paula. I mean, she was a survivor of what is the gravest catastrophe of the 20th century, the Holocaust. She survived a Nazi invasion of her hometown. She survived five concentration camps and two death march. You know, as Marjorie pointed out, she had her own sister, a younger sister, ripped from her arms, who later died in Auschwitz. You know, Paula knew a level of trauma and terror and tragedy that none of us will ever know in our lives. But for me, the story of Paula is not cause for despair, it's reason for hope. Because the incomprehensible cruelty of the world into which she was born was ultimately outweighed by the generosity of the life that she led. You know, she came to New York in 1947 to the Bronx, Palin Parkway in 1960, raised a beautiful family. She was a trailblazer, one of only three women to graduate from NYU's College of Medicine. She was a lifetime learner who knew not one, not two, but six languages. Uh, and she was a romantic who fell in love not once, but twice, including in her 80s. Uh, so a person who never stops learning and a person who never stops falling in love is a person with a passion for life. And all of us have much to learn from Paula's passionate commitment uh, to living. Uh, and so I consider her an inspiration. You know, one of the first historians, oh, the first historian was an ancient Greek uh, named Herodotus. And when he was writing his account of the Persian War, he said that the purpose of history is to never forget, is to ensure that the deeds of brave people need not be forgotten. And so today, we're here to record history by way of a street renaming. We're here to ensure that people not only never forget the depths of human evil seen in the Holocaust, but also never forget the heights of human goodness embodied in the life of Paula Naaman. Uh, and so that's what we're here to celebrate. And I think that message is needed now more than ever because it is impossible to take a hard look at the world, to take a hard look at October 7th and its aftermath and not feel a sense of overwhelming hopelessness. 
But if Paula can find hope in the face of the gravest crimes against humanity, then so can we. And so hope, I think, is her greatest legacy. And thank God that she left it behind for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And also thank you for your advocacy and compassion, especially during these trying times. Um, excuse me. Hold on. Excuse me. Have some respect. Have some respect. Have some respect. Excuse me. Tell some facts. Excuse me. We're we're honoring a lady who was in the Holocaust, ma'am. Ma'am, 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 I'm sorry. And this is why we say never forget, because we're talking about six million and we're talking about never ending trauma to the Jewish people. We're talking about anti-Semitism, uncalled for. We're talking about barbaric attack that we saw on October 7th. I have personally seen an un- edited video of the Hamas attack. I've seen the women, the children. So no one can tell me it didn't happen. And no one can tell me that they deserved it. So I'm here to bear witness and I will not stand for any hate. I will not stand to let Hamas win this because we are better and we need to call it out. Hamas is a terror group, and as you can see, they want to put us against each other. We won't let that happen. I'm not going to let it happen. Thank you. Richie won't let it happen. And so we're going to give Dr. Paula Newman the love, the respect that she deserves. More now than ever, we need to remember. We need to honor our lives and we need to talk about it, guys. Because if we don't, we see what can happen. And we will not let hate triumph. We will not let darkness uh, bury us. We're here. And so with that being said, I also wanted to highlight Ornella from uh, Assembly Member Zuccaro's office, who's uh, here. She's waving, y'all. Um, and, and a special, special note, uh, Councilmember Dinowitz uh, couldn't make it today and he wanted me uh, to thank you for your mom because he and his sister were patients of your mom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so, and he and I worked really, really hard for this today. So um, he couldn't make it because his kids have uh, a recital today. But, um, and so thank you all for attending. And I'd like to ask uh, the family uh, if you can assist me uh, in speaking and sharing about your mom. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for everybody coming today. Like this? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, thank you so much for coming. I know it's cold for some people. We're from Vermont. This is like shorts weather for us. So you heard Rabbi Katz tell the story of the tour bus driver in Israel who remembered my mother's comment, Yad Vashem that she made some 25 years prior. She was a pretty memorable woman, I think most of us would agree. And all of us gathered here today have many strong memories of her, if you knew her. So why name a street after her? We'll have no trouble remembering her even without a street sign. I've heard it said that a person is remembered only until the last person on earth to have said their name dies. So having a sign with her name on it right here in front of a school may be a way for her to be remembered a bit longer. When a curious child decides to look up who the heck is Dr. Paula Naiman and why is she on a sign in front of my school? Just like last evening, I read about Philip Leidig, who was a baker in the 1700s, and he had the biggest bakery in New York City. Ba bakeries speak to me. <laughs> or Susan and Samuel Barnes, who owned a farm on what is Barnes Avenue that was actually uh, a Native American footpath 
that ran all the way up north of the parkway. So maybe that child will read her obituary, or maybe that child will watch her show a project video interview. Maybe learn who she was and what meaning her life might hold for them. When people have said to me ruefully about this event, oh, it's a shame that the old young Israel of Pelham Parkway, which stood right here where this building is, where the school is, it's a shame it's not there anymore for this event. I've replied that I'm, I'm not really upset at all. I'm actually kind of glad. Because everyone at Young Israel Pelham Parkway knew who she was. And she was not Rabbi Rubin's favorite congregant by <laughs> any stretch of the imagination. And this is a school, a place that focuses on children. And she would have definitely preferred that this be her sign be in front of the school. Why was she not Rabbi Rubin's favorite congregant? Because she spoke out and she protested something that she thought was wrong. Rabbi Rubin used to be upset when on the Sabbath during his sermon, if a baby would cry in the sanctuary and would cause a disruption. So he would pause his sermon very sternly until the mother would take the baby out of the sanctuary and order would be restored. One Shabbos, my mother just couldn't control her outrage any longer. And she stood up in the women's section and she shouted at him as he stood on the bima, we should be rejoicing at the sound of a Jewish baby's crying in shul. We should celebrate that no one is covering their mouths to keep them quiet so as not to be discovered. Let that baby stay and be happy that we have Jewish babies alive today that can cry in shul. That memory of my mother celebrating the beauty of a Jewish baby's cry in shul was one of the first memories that popped into my head in the days after October 7th. As firsthand stories began to emerge in the media from survivors of the attacks on the kibbutzim in the Negev. Stories of babies being hidden, of babies being discovered and then murdered, and of others miraculously surviving. Of course, I thought about that pivotal point in my mother's life where she attempted to hide her sister from the Germans but was unsuccessful in keeping her safe. An event that I believe shaped the direction of the rest of her life. A life that was spent, as you know, devoted to the health and protection of children. Children give us an opportunity to unlearn hate, she used to say. We can model for them that hate has no place in our lives. As kids, we weren't even allowed to say that we hated something, let alone that we hated people. No matter how strongly I felt about them, I could only say I disliked kiwis <laughs> or lamb chops. I could only say Mrs. Ottenstein is not my favorite teacher. <laughs> And so poignantly, the internal conflict that caused my mother so much distress was that the war left her with so much hate inside of her. And that indelible hate, perhaps more than her grief, I believe, was really her heaviest burden. Over and over in these past few weeks since October 7th, I've said to people, or they have said to me, how happy and relieved we are that mom is not alive to witness this war. Some people feel that way, I think, because they believe it would trigger her past trauma from the Holocaust and trigger her grief. I feel that way because I think she would be completely 
despondent at the unending cycle of hate that has been spiraling out of control, both in the Middle East and rippling with repercussions spreading throughout the world. I think her soul would have sunk into despair seeing the inhumanity our civilization is capable of, not even a century after what was thought to be the world's most despicable display of inhumanity, which she experienced firsthand. A woman who felt it was wrong to hate a fruit, who felt lifelong inner turmoil about hating her tormentors, her sister's murderers, could not have witnessed the current atrocities that humans are inflicting upon other humans and especially upon children. She would have felt the need to, in one of her most favorite expressions of extreme exasperation, and I quote, stand screaming on a table and pull my skirt over my head. <laughs> so my biggest hope for that shiny new green sign above us in front of a school, in front of a building full of young minds born into an environment of intellectual liberty, is that some child or maybe even an adult will read about Paula Naiman and be inspired by the love that she showed to those around her, especially to children. In these days where hate and violence are inciting more hate and more violence in what feels like an unstoppable maelstrom. Let's not simply stand on tables screaming and pull our skirts over our heads. Let's be brave. Let's speak out. Let's work towards calling out dehumanization. And let's recognize the humanity that we all share. Let's remember that Paula Naiman fought her own inner battle to conquer a hate that many very moral people would deem completely justified. Let her serve as our inspiration. That would be the true Dr. Paula Naiman way. Oh. I also want to give a shout out uh, to Steve Glosser, uh, who also helped out a lot today in securing uh, Bronx House for the afterwards. Um, so thank you, thank you, Steve. And now, let's line up, y'all. Right here. Family, friends, if you want to. Hold down. Don't hold down. Hold down. Yeah. Can we get all the kids who are here? If there's, if you're a kid, come up to the front. We need you. Kids. All kids. You're getting. You're gonna pull. We're gonna pull. All kids. All kids. Calling all kids. All right. So what we do, we don't pull down. We pull up. Go ahead. Oh, this way? Oh, this way. Oh, this way. This way. Oh, this way. I think I need Layla's help. Layla, I think you're going to have to break soldiers to put us on, right? That's Paul and Layla Pesha. For my mom. Ready? Got it. Okay, so this way. This way. Pull it. Okay, wait, can we get the count down? Five. Thank you. 